Yeah, it's a very interesting time to talk about hinges because everyone switching to GEC support and uh, very often we faculty uh, facing situation when a participant saying, why we need to even know about hinges? GEC support can correct all deformities and all that. But it's a misconception because sooner or later everyone will be involved in correction of the deformities and uh, other orthopedic situation with external fixation when hinges have become the main source of movement of one uh, part of the frame about another part of the frame. So we believe that knowledge about hinges is still important and uh, uh, to eliminate your confusion uh, because you will see a lot of um, titles like constrained, unconstrained, what's the difference between them? So I think it will be important to uh, cover that and, and discuss uh, principles about that. So just to be on the same kind of level, we need to define what hinges are and uh, especially what is the mechanical nature of the hinges. So mechanical, uh, it's a mechanical bearing device that connects two solid objects allowing them to rotate relative to each other about a fixed axis of rotation. So two parts connect together, common axis of rotation, so one part rotates around another part in, around this axis of rotation. More importantly, that all other translations or rotations being prevented, and thus a hinge typically has only one degree of freedom. So you can direct your movement uh, eliminating any undesirable movements or translations at the same time. Uh, actually, hinges has a very long, have a very long history, and you will find the first uh, notice about hinges more than 5,000 years ago, when they were used in the big cities in, in the gates to rotate the part of the gates and the door and at the gates to open them. You can see reproduction of some of them in the left. It's for light doors when you can just take one beam, make a hole there, stick it to another beam, and you can rotate around this single axis of rotation. And on the right, it's like more heavy uh, doors when you can take a piece of rock, make a hole there, and that will be the hinge. It is out of hinges we learned a long time ago in Russia, so I think everyone already know how Elizarov looks. This is the guy on the left. The guy on the right, it's me 40 years ago. There's a lot of hair. But uh, if you look at the Elizarov hinge, it's the same thing. It's practically two parts, two solid objects which connect together with the bolt and the uh, nut, which uh, practically uh, create the single axis of rotation, avoiding undesirable movement at the same time. So it's the same definition as for the door hinges. It's a mechanical bearing device that connects two solid bodies um, and allowing them to rotate relative to each other around this bolt and nuts. And we were using hinges a lot. We are still using them a lot because we believe that GEC support is a fantastic device, but very often it's overkill. If you know hinges, you can simplify patient lives and your lives, but challenge not by choosing which one is better for this particular situation. And this is the um, foot, and you can see a lot of hinges there. So it's a multiple hinges, but functionally they all attach there for different purpose. Like hinge in the center, that hinge there to correct cavus deformity. The hinges on the bottom, they just to pull two parts of the foot apart from each other. The other hinges are not even related to the movements. They are just to connect frame in the static condition. So this is why we need to know what those hinges are and, and, and to be comfortable when we are attaching them for one another purpose. So clinical requirements for hinges are very simple. They're supposed to allow limb segment movement in the desired direction, practically one segment of the limb relative to another segment of the limb. They should maintain gap between joint or steotomy uh, surfaces uh, contacting to each other. And finally, they should prevent undesirable angulation translation while allowing weight bearing for the patient. So those two uh, clinical requirements are very important and uh, 
it's uh, very easy to utilize them for angular deformity correction. It's very clear, and I think everybody in the room, after spending these four days here, can very easily manipulate with those hinges for angular deformity correction. We can correct deformities, do an opening wage, uh, hinge, uh, we can correct deformity during closing wage, we can move it away and we can make lengthening at the same time, we can move it up and down of the, uh, the uh, uh, our line and you can just create translation at the same time. So we can manipulate them, it's very easy. The problem start when we are using hinges to correct position of the uh, foot or position of any segment using joint as a uh, place for rotation. So here, for example, example of the ankle joint. And the problem comes because most of the hinges what we are using are unilateral hinges. They are designed to provide movement in one plane. While most of our joints are three-dimensional structures which are very complicated axis of rotation. And you can find a lot of papers today uh, uh, to kind of um, discuss in all details about that. But what is very interesting that ankle, for example, the joint axis is not parallel to the floor. It's oblique. It's also obliquely oriented in the horizontal plane. In addition to that, it's not static axis. Its axis will fluctuate, change the position from plantar flexion to dorsal flexion. So our question now, how we can use now hinges to correct our contractures and the joints? And uh, it's very important because uh, when we are correcting this deformity, we want to not create damage. We want to correct contracture, preserving articulating surfaces of the joint, which we call protective joint motion. Good news that we have several options, and we have several options with those hinges, and the only we need to know which one to use and what indications. So for example, we can take a hinge, and we can overlap this hinge with projection of the axis of rotation of the joint. Then we can interconnect those hinges with proximal and distal external supports. And then we can make another hinges on the back to push one frame member relative to another frame member together with attached segments, foot and tibia. So now we can push it and we can rotate correcting this deformity. And that's hinge what called constraint hinge. And this is the first what we want everyone to know what the constraint hinges are. So those are hinges that provide predetermined or static axis of joint rotation. So it's practically the foot or any other segment what we are moving will go around that axis of rotation. Not the anatomical axis of rotation of the joint, but axis of that hinge. And we are lucky with when we are able to overlap them so precisely that movement occurred through the natural anatomical axis, but it's still the leading axis will be the axis of the hinge. This is constrained hinges. So how we can eliminate our problems, what we discussed before, because it's still three-dimensional structure and the axis of the joint is fluctuating and it's oblique. And remember, we were doing this yesterday uh, for equinus deformity correction. We were distracting the joint. And this is the key to kind of overlap these two problems, monolateral nature of the hinges and multiplanar nature of the axis of rotation of the joint. So when we distract, our gap between the contacting articulating surfaces, exactly the amount of space required for this axis of rotation to fluctuate. So practically, if you will distract the ankle joint seven, from seven to 12 millimeters, we are creating enough gap to avoid any uh, compression between articulating surfaces during this uh, correction of the contraction. And the same, same for the knee joint. We are distracting knee joints also to correct flexion contracture of the knee. So when we are building our constrained system, constrained frame with constrained hinges, we always need to think 
about destruction, and we always need to add destruction to, uh, to the structure. Like in this case, we always need to keep enough threaded rod on those hinges to allow it to destruct the joint. And importantly, you need to distract proximal rod, not distal one. Because the axis of rotation, won't, if you want to distract the contact, uh, create the gap between contacted surfaces, you want to move the foot down together with the axis of rotation. So you cannot distract distally, only proximally, to keep the axis of rotation in the same place. And then we can correct that. In addition to that, we can do other stuff with, with this joint because we can just distract and we can distract the connecting threaded rods, or we can take the, the hinge and move it a little bit anteriorly. And if you move the hinge anteriorly, it's similar to the opening wedge trapezoidal kind of regenerate. We can correct deformity, we can correct contracture, and same time we can distract the joint. Moreover, if you have subluxation of the joint, or subluxation of the foot, for example, talus in this case, relative to the tibia, then we can move the hinge down, and now we can correct, we can distract, and we can translate same time, just manipulating with this hinge. Don't forget about anatomical requirements because they are still important. We need relatively preserved shape of the talus. We need congruent articulating surfaces absence of any anatomical bone obstructions, and potentially smooth uh, uniplanar movement of around the single axis of rotation. It's very difficult to do this uh, uh, scientifically. It's more like feelings which you're getting through the experience. You look in the x-ray, you touch the foot and said, yeah, that's more likely will go smoothly. Okay, and some of them, you look and that said, no, there is no way to use constrained hinges here because uh, the, the, this foot will not rotate. So let me show you an example of using constrained hinge. Uh, this is a 15 year old girl with lineal scleroderma, four centimeters of tibial shortening, rigid equinus deformity with uh, practically no ankle motion, and all other symptoms associated with scleroderma. This is her weight bearing surfaces, and you can see how she walks just using her forefoot as weight-bearing surface during the gait. So treatment strategy, what we used was uh, exactly what I just described, to use constrained hinge, distract the joint, uh, and uh, if you look on the radiographs on the left, that's all practical anatomical requirements are here. So we have good contact and congregating surfaces, they're smooth, no obstructions. So we believe that we will be able to move this foot. Also, the contracture is very severe. You can see um, this on the radiograph. So the foot was stabilized with the foot uh, plate. This is our typical stabilization pattern with two long ol uh, olive wires through the entire foot, and then to, to uh, one or two metatarsal forefoot wires, and sometimes another wire through the midfoot. And then we are building our hinge, constrained hinge, overlapping this hinge with projection, what we believe, of the axis of rotation of the foot. So then, as you can see here, uh, this is the radiographs and clinical picture of the, on the beginning of uh, cor correction. This is in the end of the correction. So by destruction of the threaded rod, you can see this on the uh, right radiograph. It's, a, it's sticking out specifically for destruction, and you can distract the joint same time while you're correcting this contracture. So for that goal, we perform additional four centimeter lengthening, and this is your outcome with significant improve of the weight-bearing surfaces of the foot during um, the gait, and this is how she walks now. <coughs> so this is not only one option to accommodate for this uh, uh, oblique nature of uh, the, the, the ankle joint. Uh, we can design hinges which will allow us to, to create oblique axis of rotation of the hinge and then try to overlap this oblique axis of the hinge with the uh, oblique axis of the joint. So this is one of the examples of that. So you can use uh, multiplanar hinges 
oblique, uh, with oblique axis and place them uh, not parallel to, uh, to each other, not on the same level, but put them in the different <laughs> level so they can create this oblique axis of rotation which allowed us to correct deformity and uh, correct uh, contracture without destructing the joint or destruction with minimum amount. This is the hinge what we are using at Scottish Wright Hospital. We designed it specifically for that purpose. As you can see here, there is a ball inside the hinge, and this ball can rotate to accommodate for oblique axis of rotation. And you can see this is how it's placed on the patient, uh, creating oblique orientation of this axis, which much easier to overlap with the anatomical axis of rotation. We call this hinge phantom hinge because it's completely radiolucent. And moreover, you can put wire through the axis of rotation and then build your hinges around this wire to be very precise. Also, GEC support systems. We don't see hinges there. We only see, only, only see six struts, but hinges there. We just call this virtual hinge. It's not hardware hinge, but it's there. And uh, let me show this in the clinical example of this 15-year-old girl with rigid post-traumatic equinovarus contracture with minimum ankle range of motion. She underwent four quadrant fasciotomy due to compartment syndrome with anterior tibial arterial insufficiency uh, um, after displaced, um, displaced proximal tibial fracture secondary to fall on concrete steps. So this is her weight-bearing surfaces. Again, she's working practically using only four foot for that. And uh, this is her gait before the treatment. But if you look in her uh, radiographs, again, we can see all necessary anatomical requirements, what we discuss. Good uh, congru congruent contacting surfaces, no obstructions. Uh, preserve gap and feelings when you try that it will go. But then we are using software to preassemble the frame, to pre-build the frame for the surgery. And if you look in this radiograph, this is the software we didn't have time to use during this course, but this is called Hexray. It's a part of the Trula Hex uh, uh, system, it's uh, practically you're taking radiograph and embedding radiograph into the software and you do all your uh, calculations and analysis of deformity inside the software and then software will tell you what frame you need to build to correct this deformity. But if you look in the cross section between them, there is a point, I think, oops, right here, and this is the cross-section between anatomical axis of the tibia and vertical axis of the foot. So if you look here, this is our hinge. And this hinge also constrained hinge because we, we are telling the system where to rotate around what axis. We just cannot see it uh, by eyes. And then we can build a frame, attach this frame for the patient. And you can see radiographs in the beginning of correction and the end of the correction with overcorrection. Specifically, we are doing more uh, 5, 10 degrees of overcorrection in those situations. And the, the joint is distract because we put distraction in, in the software, so there is no difference. And then after correction is done, we are switching to turn our phantom hinges to restore range of motion in this patient. And this is your outcome. Radiographically, this is her range of motion, and this is how she walked now. So, as I mentioned, it's constraint hinges work very well when you have those anatomical requirements preserved. You need congruent articulating surfaces, then you can move. But very often we don't have this, we're not that lucky. We have incongruent articulating surfaces, we have some anatomical structures, we have something which not allow this smooth movement uh, using constraint hinges. In those situations, we are using different approach. We are using what we call unconstrained hinges. And practically, if you look here, instead of trying to overlap anything with the, anatomy, uh, with the axis of rotation, we are creating the system with hinges which can push posterior portion of the foot down 
and same time pull anterior portion of the foot up. See, there is no hinges here. What that means, that we developing unconstrained C hinge is practically using the anatomical axis of rotation of the joint. And now hinge system are not really hinges for rotation. This hinge is just to pull and push. And this is very interesting because it's allowed you to correct deformities through the anatomical axis, but also they're very good when you have different amount of contracture for the forefoot and the hind foot. For example, combination of the equinus and chaos. You can push in one amount posterior and you can pull in another amount anteriorly. And that can eliminate that. Interestingly enough, that's the first system what Elizarov was using long, long time ago. So if you look on this um, uh, document on the right, this is his uh, little book, what he wrote, and I will translate this for you. It's practically treatment of flesh and contraction of knee and ankle joints, and it's published in 1971. And that was the first place when he was talking about unconstrained systems to correct contractures, and you cannot see hinges there. Practically, he was using only one wire approximately, one wire distally, interconnect them with the frame, and you can correct deformity. This is more modern interpretation of the same. You can see hinges, but those hinges are not for rotation. Those hinges just to pull and push part of the foot. Let me show a few clinical examples and I'm done. So this example of the adult patient with severe rigid equinus deformity associated with varus cavus deformity secondary to a stroke, status spot hip adductor release, hamstring release, and failed TAL. That's the treatment strategy using unconstrained hinges. So we are pushing hind foot down and we are pulling forefoot up. And again, there is other requirements because um, you know, he, he has complex deformity of the talus, preventing these constrained hinges to use. Uh, he has both hind foot and forefoot involved on the different amount of the contracture, and he is going to have ankle arthrodesis after correction of deformity done. It's perfect case for these unconstrained hinges to use. And this is the system built on the NOR, uh, beginning and end of deformity correction, and final result after arthrodesis. Pediatric surgeons, you're not seeing adults, but you will see that, that approach in the uh, club foot correction. Because when we are correcting club foot in the small children using external fixator, there is no room to put gexapod there. But there is enough room to build hinges and use those hinges in an uh, constrained manner because we are going to, to stretch soft tissues to correct this deformity. And we, you can see a lot of hinges in these diagrams, but if you look, there are hinges for correct varus and equinus, to correct supination, pronation of the foot, uh, to correct adduction of the foot, you know, to correct anything, but none of them are hinge what we meant usually when talking about hinges. They're not for rotation, they're just to pull and push part of the foot in, in the different direction. This is last example. You can see four-year-old girl with water syndrome, type four left tibial hemimelia with club foot deformity and limb length discrepancy. She already underwent amputation on the right leg. And this is her uh, club foot uh, deformity. Radiograph and the treatment strategy to stabilize midfoot, sorry, forefoot, hind foot, and tibia, and then push and pull those uh, segments of the foot in different direction to correct deformity. And you can see we can correct varus, we can correct supination pronation, we can correct equinus, we can correct adduction, anything. But none of those hinges are hinges to move. They're all unconstrained hinges. This is her one year follow up radiographically, and this is her 13 years follow up. So the foot remained in the position. So, in summary, there are two major types of external fixation hinges and they're available for us to restore joint of motion and move uh, part of the segments. Uh, they are constrained and unconstrained. Both type of those hinges permit joint movement around the desired axis of rotation while maintaining joint destruction, preventing undesirable angulation and translation and allowing weight bearing. Constrained hinges provide predetermined static axis of rotation for joint movement, while unconstrained hinges utilize anatomical dynamic axis of joint rotation uh, for, for correction of deformities. Thank you.